Well, thanks for staying with us on the program this Monday morning. It's time to look at the state of our beloved nation, Nigeria. President Bola Metinibu, in keeping with his New Year's message to Nigerians, said that he would reshuffle his cabinet based on performance. Now, in reshuffling the president's cabinet, the president has reassigned 10 portfolios. He's outrightly sacked five ministers. Well, six in some sort if you look at the suspended humanitarian minister. But he has also made seven key appointments in terms of new ministers and what their responsibilities would be. Now, in keeping with the renewed hope mandate this morning, we're also being joined by the president of the APC Initiative for Good Governance, Ambassador Musa Tsoken, who is live in our studio this morning. Good morning to you, Ambassador. Good morning and thank you for having me. Now, now let's start very quickly with this reshuffling and rejigging of the cabinet as you have it. Did some of the names, much like the education minister who were asked to leave, did it come as a surprise to you? The minister of sports as well. Could he have been blamed on the performance of Nigeria at the Paris Olympics? Uh, and come to think of it, more speculations in line of if the economy is performing or do we also need to see the power minister being rejigged with the issues affecting the northern part of the country in terms of the eight days of blackouts being currently experienced in the country. Let's get your thoughts on that as we start our conversation. Well, the reshufflement is based on the indicators of uh, you know a performance and a credible credibility in performance in the areas of uh, uh, the ministries that uh, those who have been sacked or appointed are looking onto their performance their experience and what they are going to offer in such ministries uh, is very key in the uh, you know integration and uh, national development so it's very timely is uh, one of the promise that mr president have made and uh, being a responsive uh, you know a president he listened to what the people are saying about several ministries uh, despite the fact that uh, there are indicators and a periscope that is used to adjudicate and ascertain the level of performance in such ministries so the reshufflement is very, very timely, and uh, it's what Nigeria are expecting. Now, now, let's be very factual, and let's look at some of the controversies that have affected some of the ministers that are outgoing. Like I started in my introduction, let's look at sports. The sports ministry under the outgoing minister, Senator John Owaneno, mm -hmm. saw Nigeria's Team Nigeria at the Paris 2024 Olympics, many would say, an abysmal performance. But for the Paralympics, there were no medals recorded by Team Nigeria at the Olympics. The issues with the appointment of Finiji George, who was asked to also leave on the mutual consent following issues with the Super Eagles of Nigeria. Do you think that part of that were the controversies that helped President Bola Metinibu make up his mind saying, hey, you know what? Senator John Owaino has to go. I have already stated it clearly. Mind you, he's been re reassigned a new portfolio. It's not like he's leaving the cabinet entirely, but in terms of these controversies, do you think that it's based on some would i say hurdles he could not scale in sports there are several indicators that is used the paris olympics the, I, I i i don't want us to be largely vague i want us to name the issues because i'm coming to the outgoing minister of human affairs as well i'm going to mention the issues which are controversial in our state as well so feel free to to use the, the words. distinguished senator uh is being aligned to that particular ministry where he is now is based on the uh, issue that he will either perform much better. So, so do you think this is more more of a place where he would find himself as a round peg in a round hole? No, new yes, of portfolio. course. It's just like fixing a, 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 a round peg in a round hole. So where he is now, his performance will be more variable and uh, it, he will be more eff effective and being efficient where he is now. Now, this is coming off the back of the fact that President Bola Metinibu taught it wise to separate the Ministry of Sports from the Ministry of Youth. And in doing that, he had Dr. Jamila Bayo Ibrahim saddle the Ministry of Youth. Now, she's also left the office as well. And uh, the Minister of State for Youth, Engineer Adewale, has now been made the Minister of Youth. Uh, do you think that he needed to have taken a year of, say, trial and errors in terms of two new faces 
who for the first time are holding such an extreme position when we have some other veterans many were saying were much a supporter a supporter of the apc in the emergence of president bola metinibu that should have been given these positions it is not about that is why it is reshufflement it's not about sacking everybody on board but it's to look at uh, the, the periscope and uh, think about a way where someone will be of more you know valuable and be effective and be more efficient in that area it's all about prudency and the ability to perform much more better in the area of assignment. Ambassador, don't get me wrong. You know, it's with the urgency that Nigerians want the economy and different sectors to work. Mm -hmm. Many are saying the president had used the terms baby steps of pain. Mm -hmm. And in this reshufflement that would take several months, the president should have outrightly gone for what many would say are, are, are technocrats. Mm -hmm. Other than, you know, try with people who many would say are loyalists other than technocrats. Do you think that the time to somewhat try and fill is not there, Nigerians' patients are growing thin? Uh, in spite of the fact that uh, expertise knowledge is uh, what is needed in governance. But uh, those people that he brought on board also have the expertise knowledge. Just uh, look at uh, someone like uh, the uh, Honorable Minister of Humanitarian who have served in several capacity uh, uh, like a, a, a wreck uh, of INEC and uh, he's, a, he's a professor. So what expertise knowledge are you uh, needing in someone who has that criteria? So uh, fixing all these people, just as you have earlier said, is like putting the round, you know, peg in the round square. So, I, I mean, in the round hall. So it's very, very uh, timely and uh, it's some of the things that is needed to be done in order to effect good governance. Now, talking about previous portfolio, mm. another minister who sadly saw the sack but without the controversies is Professor Tahir Maman. Mm. An astute professor as he is, mm. one who postulated the need for reforms in the education sector mm. with the prioritization of teacher training, and also looking at the age policy to ensure that we have more mature students in the university and uh, tertiary education space. But many say these policies might have been the reason disgruntled Nigerians pushed and rumored for his out and out of office. Do you think that Professor Tahir Maman was not given the appropriate time owing to his expertise and some would say good policies on paper, but probably wrongly conveyed to Nigerians? Well, in, in spite of that, you should also be looking at uh, the uh, the antecedents or the pre-qualification and pedigree of Alosa. Alosa is also a professor, uh, although a medical doctor, but he uh, has a lot of experience and expertise knowledge that is going to also impute in that Ministry of uh, uh, Education for transformation, innovation, and upgrading that ministries as well. He has experience, he has worked severally in uh, several countries of the world, and he has been proven to be a star in such ministries uh, and uh, areas of uh, callings. So you know he was also a state minister. So he gathers such experience, and he's a nationalist. So uh, we're expecting that uh, he's going to perform adequately and transform that ministry as well. But let me also get your position on that age policy. I know clarifications have come out as to what the seating age for OIEC is and the entry age into university. Do you think 1618 changes the perception of undergraduates going into tertiary institutions? Uh, I don't subscribe to uh, the fact that uh, age limits uh, should be a serious consideration for admission into tertiary institution. Uh, much precisely now that uh, the children of nowadays are growing fast, they are precocious and uh, they are performing, their IQ is, uh, you know, above, perform, uh, you know, uh, uh, is up to standard of uh, uh, their performance. So um, th those age, I think, even at the age of uh, 16 or 17, uh, Children can still go to university and perform up to expectation. 
I am not subscribing to the fact that um, children should be up to 18 years first. But I actually understand the rationale behind, behind those age is maybe for uh, them to have a kind of uh, pretty quite uh, I mean, knowledge uh, of uh, handwork and other uh, uh, vocational training that will give them and make them perform. Even if after uh, their education, they should be able to secure uh, and be self-reliance. But that notwithstanding, uh, the most essential thing in the seeking for knowledge is to acquire that knowledge first. Any other thing can come to play as one uh, triumph in life. So uh, children that are even not up to 18 years but have the prerequisites, they have the qualification, they have the skills, they are precautious and they will be able, they will be able to perform and excel in their areas of calling or discipline. They should be allowed to uh, go to tertiary institution and uh, exhibit their talents. And I think that is going to promote uh, our education and uh, innovation uh, and technology as well. Scientific uh, writing and uh, all other uh, essential uh, outputs that is needed for children to triumph in their areas of discipline in education. Well, if you're just joining us, you're watching Morning Express live on ADBN television. We're reviewing the state of the nation, predominantly from the reshuffling of President Bola Metinibu's cabinet. We're looking at some of the ministers who got the axe. We've looked at the former education minister, Professor Tahir Maman, and some of the policies which many say are the controversies that saw him exit the door in that regard. But more predominantly, let's look at an issue that became a national controversy back in the month of May. The former Minister of Women Affairs and Social Development, Barrister Uju Kennedy Ohaneye, back in May, petitioned the Inspector General of Police, IGP Kayode Egbetoku, also seeking a court injunction to stop the Niger State Speaker in the House of Assembly, Abdul Malik Sarikindaji, from marrying off a hundred orphan girls who had lost their parents owing to banditry in Niger State. The issue became quite a national concern. It went viral on X. It was debated across different social media platforms. And at some point, the former Minister of Women Affairs withdrew her petition. But even at the ministry, she also made the blogs for having a divergent opinion on how things should be conducted in her ministry. Now, this many would say might have been some of the final strokes that broke the camel's back. But in a judification and in a judging her performance in office, I'd like to find out from Ambassador how he rates the former Minister of Women Affairs in light of this controversy. And uh, is it based off of that, or do you think that uh, she did need to go? You know, the unity of this country in the multilingual, multidimensional, and uh, religious differences, there is need for one to stray essentially and uh, proficiently into issues before delving into it. Uh, one of the social contracts uh, regulations is to, you know, provide what people cannot be able to provide for themselves. And that is the good of good governance, to be able to effect something that will promote uh, a kind of a social cohesion and also improve the life of the Nigerian citizenry. And uh, for the governor, the action he have undertook was to a kind of empower and stabilize these uh, uh, young ladies to get married instead of uh, falling into a wrong hand of prostitution and older uh, vices. So um, for the Honorable Minister, I think she has not looked properly into the issue. And um, that is what created a lot of uh, controversy. And uh, at, at the end, you know, when things happen like this, there will be a lot of uh, 
uh, yearnings and aspiration as well as prayers. I think uh, that is one of the things that uh, swap her in the ocean of, uh, you know, uh, swinging out of the system. Now, and the last person I want to ask about is many who, many Nigerians, but for those in her close circle or those who work in the tourism sector, knew of. Her activities were largely kept under the wraps. I'm talking about the former Minister of Tourism, Lola Adejon, who has also been asked to go. She's part of the five ministers who were outrightly sacked. Now, looking at Nigeria's vast tourism potentials, do you think that in her stay in office, it was indeed an underperformance? Well, you see, the area of, of uh, tourism is one of the essential area and a very key uh, sector that need a holistic management and uh, a prudent, you know, an effective and efficient uh, results. Tourism encompasses area that have to do with our resources. You know, Nigeria is, uh, you know, endowed with potentials, uh, both, uh, you know, human and natural resources. Area of uh, tourism is a key area that need to be promoted and uh, it is an area that is systemic for the development of the nation. Going by the fact that uh, all these, our potentials need to be exploited. is by so doing that it will even attract investors. We have, uh, for instance, area like uh, uh, in Tarabo State, uh, uh, local, uh, Saudona local government. So, you know, such areas are areas that are very viable and need to be exploited. So, if you are given a very sensitive position like that, you must have to extend your tentacles and see beyond the ordinary eyes. Do something more proficient in order to bring something that is going to transcend and improve the economy of the country. So if something contrary to that is done, you know, uh, actually it's a cox in that ministry and uh, to be candid, a more proficient and uh, more active, more innovative, someone have to be replaced in order to bring out the best of what is needed in the tourism sector. Now, we'll come back in the coming days to review the newly appointed ministers and their performance going into the final weeks, or should I say months of the year 2024. But in keeping with other matters that are also gaining momentum and uh, becoming controversial in their stead, mm. let's leave the federal government and come down to the states. Mm. Now, Governor Alex Oti has made headlines and owing to some investigative reports, it has been revealed that he awarded contracts running into billions of naira to a friend who reportedly supported his campaign by buying vehicles, who also happens to be a senior advocate of Nigeria. Mm. Now, this is another challenging issue with how procurement and governance happens, the awarding of contracts, and the transparency that needs to be followed in through and through. I don't know if you follow the story and you care to make comments on it. Yeah, uh, definitely uh, one of the potential, uh, you know, indicator of good governance is, uh, uh, you know, uh, transparency, accountability, and uh, responsiveness uh, as well. So you see, uh, if contract will be awarded not based on merit, but based just because uh, some the, yes, polit political patronage, yeah, have purchased uh, you know some the incentives, and uh, they need to be rewarded in such a manner, you know, it raises so many questions. So uh, you know, this issue is raised as as a result of. Uh, in accountability and um, uh, fair treatment in awarding contracts. So uh, it's something that have to be properly looked into and the, the governor as well will be responsive enough to see the need for him to do the right thing and award contracts to people that are, you know, qualify for such contracts, not only to friends. And uh, those that have and cronies. Been, uh, that, this, yeah. this brings into question the bidding process for the award of these contracts, mm -hmm. the time in which it's made public, and in keeping with the guidelines. Mm -hmm. Who is saddled with ensuring that the bidding processes of these contracts and the awarding follow due process? 
You see, this is another area of concern. And uh, in good governance, law of law, uh, I mean, uh, rules of law have an equity must have to be abided by. And if such rules of laws and equity will be abided by, it, then it is enough a measurement of giving out this contract to the people that best qualify for this contract. So it is a, a clearly stated and uh, well documented facts of how to go about it, how to procure some of these uh, contracts and uh, the essential way to go about it. So if a contrary steps is being taken in awarding such contracts and, uh, uh, you know, is very, very uh, unfortunate and uh, something more proactive have to be done in order to correct uh, such, uh, you know, irregularities in area of uh, awarding contracts. Now, now, do you think that the Public Procurement Act of 2007 at this point needs to be amended with a review to effect some of the brilliant suggestions you've just raised? Yes, of course. It need to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, amended to reflect the national interest and due process in equity. Now, in staying with issues among states in Nigeria, since the federal government, in keeping with the demand for a new minimum wage and the ascent of the new minimum wage bill by the House of uh, the 10th Senate and House of Assembly as well, we've seen some state governments even go above the 70,000 naira as approved. Now, it almost feels as a competition between states where the IGR is high. But we can recall that even the 30,000 naira previous minimum wage was not implemented by some states as well. Mm. Do you have any concerns going forward that this would be replicated even with the 70,000 naira minimum wage as approved by the federal government? Well, it's a, it's a positive, uh, I mean, positive step taken by some of the governors to be able to augment uh, their salary scale, I mean, minimum wage above 70,000. Uh, one thing that people have to take into cognizance is the fact that behind the the uh, normal statutory allocation is that is allocated to state governors or state governments. Government or uh, state government also generates their internal revenues, and beside that, I want to state here also that if you look at what the governors we are collecting prior to this administration you will see that uh, some governors we are collecting barely, let's say, 4 billion to 5 billion. Some of these governors that we are collecting uh, 4 million to 5 million, I mean 4 billion to 5 billion, are collecting up to 13 to 14 billion naira. In terms of FAC, FAC allocation. Yes, of course. So, you know, besides the internal generation revenue, still some of these state goes to collect loans also from other international monetary bodies. So you see the amount of revenue that is, you know, being given or is source in the state level is so gigantic and enormous to enable the state governors even pay more than the federal government. You understand? So uh, if some uh, state governors are able to you know, paid up to 80,000, I, I would say kudos to such governors. And uh, they should be proactive and do more, even more than what, uh, you know, like some of them that have been able to pay up to 80. And for those that have not been able to pay up to that amount, up to this moment, I will ask question, what are they waiting for? Some of this money were given to them to mitigate the suffering as a result of reduce, uh, you, you know, uh, 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 the, 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 the subsidy removal on gasoline, which amounted to uh, 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 the, the, the change in the pump price and hike up in the pump price of uh, uh, fuel. So the governors need to do more, and even more, in order to improve the standard of living of the masses of their areas. They have to do a lot. Because 
if you see what they were collecting prior to this administration, is far less than what they are collecting. It has been tripled. So, but it is unfortunate that to see that some governors are not performing up to expectation by giving what is due for their citizenry in paying their salaries, pension, and uh, primary school teachers, uh, uh, and, and local government teachers. Thank God for the uh, the local government autonomy. Now, now talking about the local <laughs> government autonomy, it's important at this time because... Yeah. Now, the burden of catering for the wages and remuneration of state workers yeah. would now be taken off the shoulders of the governor yeah. and would rest with the local government chairman. Mm. But whilst this issue of local government autonomy, especially financial autonomy, mm. remains a headache, we're looking at the Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, also talking about following the finances that are going to be disbursed to local government chairman yeah. and the operationality. Yeah. Do you think that in its actuality, the anti-graft agency can keep local governments on their toes to ensure that we don't still have a case, a case of local government um, workers and teachers mm. bemoaning unpaid salaries or a lack of implementation of the new minimum wage? Uh, it's very, very important. And, you know, beside that, there are other things that are on ground. Some state governors go to the extent of collecting loans to the local government level. But that money is not being transcended down into the government. So it's a very serious uh, issue. So the, the federal government have to take a proper look at it and do something that when this money is being released, the local government will have their money in bulk instead of uh, some of this money being hung as a result of loans that were in uh, sufficiently or they are misappropriately collected by the governors. So something proactive has to be done from the, uh, you know, the federal government to ensure that any money that is being allocated to the local government is either one, the money flows down to the local, uh, uh, local government without any cocks, like uh, issue of loans that we have formally collected by the governors, or some of these loans should be wiped out to enable the local government perform to expectation. If not, even with the local government autonomy, the money or the resources or funds that is being, you know, uh, allocated to the local government will not find its way down to the local level to be able to implement some of the social contracts and give efficiency and effective service to the people. So federal government should also talk, take a proper look at that in order to see that uh, the masses at the grassroots benefit efficiently. Now, we've been talking about some of the loans and the functions of this international monetary bodies, much like you put them. Yeah. There's also been the IMF advice to President Bola Metinibu, which was hinged on the removal of subsidies in the petroleum sector and also in the electricity sector. But this morning, some of the major stories we looked at also condemned the IMF. One of the prominent voices in those condemnations were led by the Nigerian Labour Congress, which has blamed the World Bank and IMF of impoverishing Nigeria and leaving us debt reading. In coming out of that bad situation, many are saying it will take the country 25 years to double our economic growth. Mm. Do you think that the advices from this International Monetary Fund and World Bank could have been better handled by the current administration? You see, I respect, have high respect for professionalism. And uh, International Monetary Fund, in spite of the fact that uh, uh, some will look at the policy, their policies has very, been very harsh to the Nigerian economy. Uh, I think um, I, we must have to look twice in some of uh, these, their policies. Even for the fact that uh, it may not go down well for the uh, people of uh, Nigeria. We have to look properly into it, even if we are not going to adopt the whole scenario and take it as a war. We have to look properly at it. Uh, the Nigerian nation is facing a serious uh, economic crisis uh, where masses find it very difficult 
to uh, either end their livings or being able to uh, take care of uh, their daily needs for even, uh, you know, to feed themselves and take charge of some of their responsibilities. But then, if you look at the Nigerian factor, Nigeria is, uh, is uh, highly indebted. When President Bola Tinubu came into power, if you look at the debt services, was so high. But uh, because of the uh, international, uh, you know, relationship that is being established, uh, he was able to, you know, reduce some of this debt service to uh, a very high degree. So, and I think that have to do with some professionalism and uh, advices that may come from uh, a high body like that uh, uh, IMF. So, but that notwithstanding, um, I will say that uh, uh, we should do our homework very well. Rather than blaming the IMF, let us put our hands together and look at our economy and what is proficient for us to do is to uplift the standard of living of our masses should be our first priority. By mere conversation or advice, it doesn't mean that uh, we must have to abide 100% what, by whatsoever they are doing. But we shouldn't look at what advice they are giving us as if it is nonsensical and uh, we should be you know hammering uh, hammering on that and uh, making some too much noises Let's now i'm talking about this noise mm. that you're talking about there's a lot of noise on social media yeah. and nigerians are coming from a perspective of concern mm. because the word on the streets and as published by the media is the fact that the mm. federal government is planning a tax overhaul mm. in order to be able to qualify to access the 750 million dollar mm. world bank loan mm. now what that means is that there are conditionalities that Nigeria needs to meet. And at this point, regardless of the interest of the citizen, economic stabilization plan is hinged on that 750 million naira, which the federal government, by this notice, is looking to obtain at all costs. Mm. That's why some Nigerians are making that noise and are concerned on the moratorium for one and the fact that these tax reforms might also increase the hardship on its citizenry. No, I think the other way around because um, one of it, the essential way of resolving countries' situations is their physical stand. And money generation to be able to carry out some of these uh, uh, social uh, contracts is very, very integral. So uh, we thought, like, for instance, now Nigerian uh, budget. If you look at the, the Nigerian budget, and cons compare it some of the uh, uh, Western or African uh, countries, you will see that it's low. So what do you do in order to augment this budget? And what do you do in order to ensure that you get some of the contracts being affected? You need resources. So some of these resources can either be sourced within or outside the country. So these are, if you look at uh, some other countries of the world where uh, the world have been proud of them, if you look at their 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 their, their, their debt, uh, you know, status, you will see that for them, for them to be able to effect some changes effectively and do some other things for their country, they also have to borrow. So um, some conditionalities that will permit us to lay our hands in resources that will be able to be uh, be available in our disposal to execute some of the social, uh, social contract. Uh, we should look properly into it. Now, Ambassador, I'm also coming from the angle of a legislative proposal mm. for an increase in value-added tax, which currently stands at 7.5%. Mm. The timeline is that by 2025, there will be a 10% increment on value-added tax. Uh, we bring it to 10% 10, uh, 10 from 7.5%. Mm -hmm. And by 2030, value-added tax in Nigeria would be 15%. Mm -hmm. Looking at these projections on the increase for VAT, mm -hmm. 
do you think that the current cost of running businesses, especially with the epileptic power supply, would support these projections to raise VATs regardless? Don't you think that it would be a bit too much for the businesses to handle? Uh, we have stated here clearly one certain time uh, the intention of the federal government to inject some amount of money which amount to about two trillion uh, in some of these critical areas you have made mention of. And uh, the government is well aware of that and uh, have put on all these steps in order to see that some of these things when they come into play they should be mitigated. So, um, uh, I'm not a professional when it comes to economics. When it comes to that section or sector of, uh, you know, trying to a kind of have a grip of, uh, you know, tax and taxes. But one thing I actually know is that. Uh, Country generates revenues in order to implement some of their social contract through taxes. But if that is going to affect uh, the, uh, the ordinary man on the street, uh, a proper proportion of how that will be resolved in order to reduce uh, the effects on the masses should be properly be looked at. And I think professionals in that phase have to be, uh, you know, consulted adequately to give a perfect answer to that. Because in that regard, if you want to give a layman explanation to that, you may end up uh, <laughs> not giving the, 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 the correct, uh, I mean, the correct answer. But what we are looking onto and what we are aware is that country prosper as a result of uh, revenue generation but uh, if that revenue is being generated and uh, is equitably distributed in areas of concern to mitigate the suffering of the ordinary man on the street uh, that is the question that is not going to uh, affect the masses grossly so um, adequate uh, you know attention to, should be given on that so that uh, the expert within the country will deliberate on that. I know Mr. President is someone who is very responsive when it comes to issues like that. And of course, Mr. Tayo Ayodele is handling the tax committee. But before we leave the IMF issue and mm. talk about the impending strike mm. in the academic sector, the last uh, advice from the IMF to President Bola Metinibu is to ensure that the NNPCL is thoroughly audited and uh, some of the profit margins are clearly spelt out in terms of its debts and remittances. Mm. Do you think that uh, some of the canker worms of the NNPCL might be bravely opened by President Bola Metinibu? Uh, that is another topic for another day. But towards that direction, uh, you know, anything that has to do with revenue generation and uh, the ability of the generation of that revenue to be transcended to uh, the uh, from the state level down to the local government to effect positive changes in the life of people is very very important. But uh, just as I've earlier said, uh, that aspect uh, I don't want to go delve my hands uh, so deeply into it. But at some point in the country, Nigerians would also be interested in how we can unbundle some of the mysteries happening in the NNPCL. But just in closing, mm -hmm. since we have 10 more minutes to go, mm -hmm. another issue is the academic sector, particularly in terms of withheld salaries. Mm -hmm. During the point ASU was on strike, the non-academic unions in NASU, SANU embarked on a solidarity strike. Mm -hmm. Their salaries were withheld for four months, and despite several ultimatums issued to the federal government, mm -hmm. there's been a lack of settlement. This morning, we hear that a nationwide indefinite strike is about to begin. Many would say non-academic, but they also hold a key function in ensuring that the academic uh, environment thrives and learning can go on in a conducive atmosphere. At this point, how do we, as a country, and with the ministry saddled in handling and resolving this issue, 
take it to be a matter of priority because a lot of accusations for past administrations is that Nigeria always fails to prioritize education. Uh, education is very key in every country for uh, you know sustainable uh, upliftment in all areas of discipline because education has not excluded any sector. If, uh, is, if education is being neglected and uh, there is a lacuna in advancement in the areas of education, then the country is born to fail. So education is an area or sector that will be, should be given a high sense of belonging and priority. Uh, but I don't prioritize or see the, the need for going on strike again and again and again. We should rather be looking at uh, the steps, possible steps of dialoguing, where uh, some uh, mediation, uh, some uh, dialogue, and all other indices of uh, you know reconciliation will be considered in order to uh, you know resolve that issue of strike. Because once uh, the, 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 the the ASU go on strike is going to affect not only uh, the education sector, but even businesses and uh, uh, all areas of uh, uh, human endeavor. Once education is touched, every facet of life is being touched. So I'm uh, uh, appealing that uh, they should look for uh, more resolvable ways through dialogue, uh, negotiation, reconciliation, and uh, uh, you know, uh, look at possible ways of uh, resolving the matter. And uh, you see, when you talk about all those, uh, I don't think it's, it's uh, during this administration that uh, all those um, uh, claims going on uh, have took place. But that notwithstanding, uh, is government is a continual process. What uh, happens in the previous uh, administration can still uh, be taken into consideration and tackled by this government, but I uh, also have to also look at it in the way of dialogue, so that it will not affect the education of our children. Well, I must thank you, Ambassador. It will be a fine place to leave it this morning, having looked at prominent issues in the news. But before mm. you go, mm. uh, let's get your concluding statement as well. Yes. Uh, we have talked about several things, including the, uh, you know, cabinet reshuffle and uh, others. But there is this eight other areas to which I would like to call the attention of the Mr. President, the Vice President, uh, the Senate President, the Speaker, and the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, and all other key factors to take a proper look at it. I mean, the the, the Ministry of Interior. There are several, you know, outcry that uh, is coming up as a result of uh, some uh, irregularities that people thought is going. You know, we are advocates of good governance. And in spite of the fact that uh, we are with the uh, sitting government, we are supporting, projecting, promoting the government of the day, it doesn't mean that uh, if we see what we should call the attention of the federal government to it, we will just keep silence. Uh, I think they should make a thorough investigation of what is going on on the Ministry of Interior regarding the board constitution and um, some the, you know uh, rumors that is going the, uh, around that uh, the, 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 the secretary of the board have failed to effect some the, uh, you know court cases and orders that uh, we are giving pre uh, prior to, you know, uh, some investigation and uh, what have you. So a proper check should be made because the Ministry of Interior is so large that it uh, encompasses like, uh, uh, you know, the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense, Fire Service, uh, uh, Correctional Services and other sectors. So uh, a proper check should be made on that. You know, sometimes when things come from opposition, we just look at it as if it's just opposition, so we should be silenced about it. No. In order to effect good governance, there must be responsiveness on what people say because they serve as, you know, a check 
the tax uh, the, the, the tax as an items of check. It's just like the eyes that sees it does not see itself. So when sometimes the opposition or people cry, which we have to take an in that depth look at and uh, at what they are saying, so that we we'll come out with positive solution to our problem. Well, we do appreciate you, Ambassador Token Musa, again, once again, for gracing the program with your objective opinions. We appreciate you. Thank you very much.